Okay. So we are fine. So this will take a maximum value that is twice s. Okay. And when you put in that value, this will turn out to be this. So that's for one bond. Now the question is, what is the uh, what is the ground state energy? What is the minimum energy for uh, spins on a lattice? And that lattice need not be a square lattice. For you know, ease, I have drawn a square lattice. It can be any lattice uh, in any dimension. It can even be a sort of chain in one D or uh, whatever. So we are studying the ground state. We are uh, not yet interested in. Turn the screen share at stop. Um, could you say that again? I couldn't hear you. The screen share is, I mean, the. Uh, oh, it stopped. Ah, uh, because I forgot to check that. Okay, um, so right. So this is the minimum energy uh, uh, for one particular uh, bond. And when do we get that minimum energy? When we get that minimum energy, when S i plus is j is twice s so that's the sort of maximum that you can have and you will get this energy when uh, both this both these spins are in the ss state it's is of course fixed uh, is z is equal to s you will get that energy so this is important so now what we are interested in is the ground state energy of the entire system, the spin system on a lattice. So we can write that the ground state energy of the ferromagnetic Heisenberg model will be equal to or greater than uh, this sum over the minimum of the bond energy. Now, why this greater than? So I was trying to argue last time that in a ferromagnet, we'll see that this problem doesn't arise, but there can be other situations where you know how to uh, minimize the energy of a particular bond, but then when you take the entire system, the entire lattice, you cannot simultaneously uh, minimize energies of um, all the bonds. But here, uh, so here the, the uh, General argument is that if I can find a state such that um, you know all the bonds, all the bond energies are simultaneously minimized, then I'll get the uh, equal sign here, and that will be the ground state of the system. So if I can find a configuration in which all the bond energies are simultaneously minimized then there's nothing more you can do. There's no other, I mean, there's no way you can lower the energy any further. So that has to be the ground state energy of the system. Or in case the ground state happens to be degenerate, then it will at least be one of the ground states of the system, okay? So, so the question we are now asking is, in the ferromagnetic Heisenberg model, can we find a state in which all bond energies are simultaneously minimized? And the answer is yes, kind of obviously, uh, because if we take all the spins to be in the maximally, uh, 
maximal value in the in, in the maximum value of SZ state. So if I take if I take all the spins in S S Z state, then um, all the bond energies will be minimized, and that will give me at least one of the ground states of uh, the model. Okay, now uh, the question is, what is the energy in that state? Uh, so I know what is the bond energy of a particular bond when both the spins are in S Z equal to S state. And so what I have to do now is to find out what is the energy of the entire sort of uh, lattice system. So here I introduce some uh, no, uh, notations that we will be using. So I'll erase this part. Okay, so that's the lattice. Uh, all the spins are in S is the state. So each IJ, nearest neighbor IJ, has energy. So what did we calculate? It is um, minus J is squared. So what is the total energy then? Uh, what I'll basically do is I have, we have to sum over all the bond energies and that can be written as uh, So what is this? Uh, so let's see here. Um, S squared, uh, mod J squared is what you'll get from each bond. Now, when I look at a particular site, so basically, so I have to sum this over all distinct bonds. So when I consider one particular site, I, it is interacting with four neighbors on this particular uh, lattice. It could be, the number could be different on a different lattice. So the number of neighbors is what we call Z. Okay, so Z is the number of nearest neighbors. Uh, so each site will then contribute an energy which is um, mod j z s squared. Uh, there has to be a factor of L. So then, but when I suppose, so this is what I'll get from each site. But then I suppose I sum over all sites. I'll get a factor of L then, okay? L is the number of sites in my lattice. So this will give me G Z S squared L. But then there is a double counting here because uh, consider this site. So when I'm coming over sites, I'm, uh, for I, I'm considering this bond. And when I'm coming to this site in the sum over site, I'm considering this bond again because this happens to be its nearest neighbor. So there is a double counting. So in order to avoid that double counting, I have taken a factor of half here. So that's the total energy of the system, the ground state energy of the ferromagnetic um, ferromagnetic Heisenberg model. Okay. Right. The next question is, is this, uh, is this state non-degenerate or degenerate? How do we get this state? We get this state when all the spins are maximally polarized. 
So all sides I, uh, the Z component of the spin on all sides is equal to S in this ground state. So S Z total of the entire system that has to be L times S. And so if you, now, now, now think of the entire system with L spin S objects, okay? So you are summing over L spins. So these are the spins. So what is the maximum value it can take? The maximum value it can take, the maximum of that is LS. You are summing L quantum spins. Each one is S. So the maximum spin you can get is LS. And you have a state in which SZ is equal to LS. So then you, you are in that state, okay? So when I consider the net spin of, uh, of all the L sides, uh, the ground state is this state. So this state we wrote down here is this state, LS, LS. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Yeah, there's some disturbance in between. Okay, let's see. But then, uh, so this is the state we wrote down here, but then look at the Hamiltonian, I have erased that, but That was the Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian is spin rotationally invariant. By that we mean that if we rotate all the spins by the same amount, uh, the Hamiltonian does not change. So I, I can consider equally consider other orientations of the spins, uh, which would sort of give me different uh, different values of S Z, but then that would, should not change the energy. Okay. So then that suggests that the ground state has to be 2LS plus one fold. Degenerate. Because uh, the total spin is LS and uh, which can have two LS plus one different values of LZ and the Hamiltonian is spin rotationally invariant. So all of those, those states would give me the same energy and therefore the ground state is two LS plus one for region. Okay, so uh, that's one of the things. And this, uh, uh, so this degeneracy of the ground state is actually again a consequence of uh, broken symmetry. So what we have broken, the symmetry we have broken in this ground state, for example, is the continuous spin rotational symmetry. When we talk of a particular ground state, let's say this LS, LS state, uh, what we have broken is the spin rotational symmetry of the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is spin rotationally invariant, but this state has a definite value of SZ. So that symmetry is broken here. So it's a broken symmetry state. And when you have such situations, you tend to have degenerate ground states. Okay. Um, now the question is, and this is how we'll slowly uh, connect it to the excitations of, of 
above the ground state. So we know the ground state. Um, um, it degenerates. We know what its degeneracy is. Now the question is, suppose I want to do statistical mechanics of the system in the sense that suppose I'm at finite temperature and I want to calculate uh, how the magnetization, which is related to um, the expectation value of the SZ operator behave as a function of temperature. So in order to be able to calculate such quantities, what we have to do is to do statistical mechanics at the finite temperature of the system for which I have the first thing I have to calculate is the partition function. So when I calculate the partition function, so we can see that MZ, the magnetization along the Z direction is related to the expectation value of the total SZ. Uh, so, uh, to, to calculate these things, I have to evaluate the partition function. I mean, there could be other things that you are interested in calculating, but this is an obvious example. Um, so, where these EIs are energies of various you know, states that the system can have. And now if you consider all possible states the system can have, uh, so it can have a Z, all the way from ls to minus ls and you sum over all possible states the magnetization will always uh, turn out to be zero there is no external magnetic field and when if you try to uh, evaluate expectation values with by considering all possible states with is it from ls to minus ls the magnetization will always turn out to be zero because you know plus and minus contributions will cancel each other so that's not the correct so what do we do how how do we do uh, statistical mechanics in such situations i mean this is connected to more deeper questions of ergodicity and so on which we need not get into uh, what i want to do is to sort of uh, tell you how to systematically do statistical mechanics in such cases and how that sort of takes us to the discussion of excitations about the ground state, which is an important thing in such systems. And it will become more interesting uh, when we get to the discussion of antiferromagnetic Heisenberg models. Okay. Um, all right. So what we do is uh, basically, uh, this sum um, that we do, we, we have to restrict that to one of the ground states. So let's say I, I take the LS, LS ground state. And if I restrict my Hilbert space uh, to only finite excitations above this ground state, then I'll get a systematic result, meaningful result. Now, what do I mean by finite excitations above this state. Uh, we, so basically the, the point I'm trying to make is that we consider finite excitation above this state means finite number of spins are not in the S, S state. So I have uh, um, so a finite number of states out of a total L has sort of stepped down from the S, S 
state. So their is weight values are somewhat different from S. But only a finite fraction of them. So if N have such values which are not equal to S, I'm talking of a situation where this N is much less than F. So that's what is meant by finite expectation. And again, a hand waving sort of argument is that now consider two situations where uh, you have this state, which is maximally polarized, that is uh, LS with LS is the equal to ls so i'll draw that like this and some other state so this state let us call that the state psi i the ground state psi i i consider another state another ground state in which the spins the, the total spin could be oriented in some other direction okay but because of spin rotational symmetry it has the same uh, ground spin energy so we'll call this psi 2. These two are the two states. Okay. Now, uh, now I'm considering finite expectations, let's say about this state. So when I take scalar products of that finite expectation state above psi 1, what I have is a finite number of the spins in the lattice are uh, not in SS state, but some other state where the is it components are less than the maximum possible and i take so i call that uh, what do i call it let's call that psi i prime is the finite excitation about the speed psi i and I take the scalar product, I, I, it's difficult to write, but uh, let me put the prime here, then it is easier, psi two. And this scalar product, um, there are several ways you can think about it, but if you think about it classically, then this scalar product will be like, cos theta to the power of L over N, sorry, A cos theta to the power L minus N because only L minus N of the spins, uh, they make this angle, if this angle is theta, they make an angle theta with each other. And so that will uh, be sort of, so, so when I take the scalar product, I mean, the scalar product cannot be sort of greater than this, uh, this classical uh, overlap, okay? And the classical overlap will be this. And in the limit when uh, L goes to infinity, so this goes to zero as L goes to infinity because cos theta will be something less than one. So, uh, so this will go to zero as so these two, the classical overlap between, between such states will be vanishingly small in the thermodynamic limit when L goes to infinity and therefore uh, they are classically sort of distinguishable. Now using that argument, what we can say is that as long as we have finite excitations about such states, uh, they will not sort of uh, mix with each other. And I, I can do the thermodynamics by confining uh, my sort of this sum when I calculate the partition function to this ground state or any of the ground state and only finite excitations about them. As long as I'm doing that, that or that approximation is, is, is a good one, uh, I'm fine. Okay. Uh, all right. So, So with that idea, I don't worry about, I don't need to worry about this 2L plus, 2LS plus one for degeneracy and the other ground state and so on. I can just pretend that this is the ground state and do further analysis about this ground state.
Okay. So what is this analysis? What are what are the possible excitations about this ground state? So that is the next thing that we want to look at. This was sort of a prelude to that. That we are uh, confining ourselves to finite excitations about one of the ground states, and when we do that, we can forget about the other ground states and pretend that this is my ground state, this is the ground state, and we are looking at excitations about that ground state. So. These are quantum spins. There are L of them on L lattice sites. So what is the uh, smallest and lowest energy sort of, uh, what is the lowest spin excitation we can think of? When they are all maximally polarized, that's the ground state that we have argued and accepted. And then I want to excite this system. So when all of them are in S z equal to S state, that's the ground state. The minimum I can do is to change S z value of one of the spins on a particular site, on any site, from S to S minus one. Okay, so uh, let's say on I, I, I change the spin uh, from the S, S state, step, I step it down to S, S minus one state. So when I create such an excitation, or I create such a disturbance and let it propagate through the system, I get what is called A spin wave. A spin wave or a magnon. I'll, I'll come to that. We'll we'll get into detailed discussion of these things. So these are excitations. These are excitations. These are collective excitations, and we'll see why we call them collective excitations above the ground state of the ferromagnetic model. Uh, so, um, yeah, so how do we uh, go ahead and understand? So let, let us now try to understand in some more detail what these spin waves are, uh, so that finally we can arrive at some physical uh, picture of it, what we are talking about, because the first time you learn about uh, the spin waves, it can seem very confusing. So. First, some elementary discussion, at the end of which we'll uh, arrive at a uh, somewhat uh, physical uh, schematic picture of what a spin wave is. But then we'll get into more formal treatment of spin wave and derive its uh, dispersion relation. Okay, how spin wave energies go as as, as uh, wave number. Okay. So basically what I'm saying is that we are, uh, set, the, the spin is stepped down, the spin at site I is stepped down. So I, I, I denote by zero the ground state of the ferromagnet. This is the vacuum, this is the vacuum for spin waves. There are no spin waves in this state. But then I create that state where one of the spin is S minus one, and I call that Ri, this state is Ri, in which, which is defined this way. Or I can just write minus sign. Spin lowering operator, acting on that ground state will give you a state in which uh, the spin at site i with the whose, whose location the lattice site is located at some ri is is lowered by one unit okay the z is lowered by one unit so that's the that's how that state is defined 
Now the Hamiltonian here, I'll do this exercise because this exercise will be uh, useful when we discuss antiferromagnets. Also, this can easily be seen to be written as Now there, what I'll do is I'll write the SX and SYs in terms of S plus and then S minus. Okay, uh, so if you do that, uh, the factor of four is I plus S C. Minus, minus. Then you can manipulate those terms and eventually the factor that you will get is uh, there's a factor of G by two. Okay, so the point here is that uh, this Hamiltonian, you can either look at it this way in terms of Z, SX and SY components or equivalently SZ and, you know, in terms of S pluses and S minuses. Uh, and because, uh, because this state, this state RI in which one of the things has been um, lowered to its minus one, uh, this is not going to be an eigenstate of this Hamiltonian because uh, if, if that is the ith the uh, ith uh, site here, then I plus, of course, I minus would act and I plus would also act on it and give you non-zero uh, values, non-zero, non-vanishing states. So therefore, um, it turns out that this state is not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. But on the other hand, you can easily check that, I mean, these are things that I'll uh, leave as exercise for you. Mm. Okay, so if you do this, it's minus, okay. Plus I acting on Ri, you will get from definition and and the uh, you know the way if plus if minus operators act on various beam states, you will get this to be twice if Rg. So this is something uh, I'll ask you to work out. So basically see what it does, SI plus. Now, if you were in the ground state, SI plus on the ground state would give you zero because you cannot raise the spins any further. But in, on this state, this will not give you zero because one of the spins has been already lowered. So it can raise that. And then when you have this terms acting on this state and these sort of terms come in the Hamiltonian, when this sort of terms act on that state, what it basically does is it, it shifts the spin lowering from the ith side 
to the jth site. So that is one thing that you notice. And yeah, so with that, and also, I mean, this next step is of course obvious. I mean, is Z acting on, uh, is Z I acting on, no, I would say is J, J acting on R I is, S R I, if I is not equal to J, I is the state where the spin has been lowered and is equal to S minus one R I, if I is equal to J. Now using these basically you can, you can show that the action of the Hamiltonian action of this Hamiltonian on the state Ri will give you this. E0 is the ground state. Um, E0 is the ground, ground state energy that we, that we wrote earlier. Uh, plus Sg. Delta now what are delta deltas are the nearest neighbors of the ith site on which i have so this is the on this lattice there will be four deltas you can take deltas to be the the vectors to the nearest neighbor side. So basically you understand. So these deltas go over, sum over deltas go over the sum over nearest neighbors of the site I. So when Hamiltonian, so the point here is that, I mean, working this out using these relations is pretty straightforward. You have just to sit down and do the algebra carefully. There's nothing complicated about it. But the point to note here after you've got this is that a Hamiltonian acting on such a state so this is not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, but it gives you something which is a linear combination of such states. So this is a state in which the spin at I has been lowered by one unit. This is a state in which the spin at one of the nearest neighbors of delta, uh, nearest neighbors of I has been lowered by one unit. So these are same kind of states and Hamiltonian acting on this gives you this term plus things that are linear combination of, of such uh, states in which one spin has been lowered by one unit. All right. Um, so then that gives you the idea that if you can construct appropriate linear combination of such states in which spin at one site has been lowered by one unit, maybe they will turn out to be uh, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So that's what we are now trying to work out. So we are trying to work out states that are linear combination of states like this and see how they become eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, what are the energies and so on. So if we find that, that means that we have found excited states of the system. Okay. So. So consider the state
that is i am considering linear combination of states this sum i goes over all that is right so there is a factor normalization factor mm. this should be l okay so i am considering states a linear combination of states in which sin at each of the uh, one side has been lowered by one unit and i consider such states at all sides and then with this sort of uh, weight i add them up so what does that give you if you act the hamiltonian on this state you can show that this turns out to be some number which is of course dependent on k times the state so this is an eigen state of the hamiltonian again this is worked out in uh, ashcroft's book you can check that i'll leave that for you as an exercise because we'll eventually get this number uh in a different way in a more sort of elaborate way but the point here is that this state is an eigen state of the hamiltonian and you can work out the energy so instead of working out the algebra here uh what we'll do is we'll try to understand what this state is so let us make us attempt to understand that uh so the points to note is that first in this state uh since this is a linear combination of states in each of which the spin at one of the lattice sides has been lowered by one unit the lz value in this state not lz the sz value the total sz in the state k has to be ls minus 1 um aman can you hear me now i mean uh, or, or, or you still have a problem okay uh, that is point number 1 what is the probability that the spin is lowered at some site i so what i'll do is i'll take this and mod squared of that which will give me um because these states are orthonormal uh what you will get is this will be this so this this is interesting because what this tells you is that the this entire this state has is it equal to ls minus 1 but this lowering of one unit is now equally distributed over all sides it it's not localized as a as at a particular site this is a this is a sum over states uh each one of which has a spin lowered by one unit and when you take that in this state in the superposition state the probability that the spin at a particular site is lowered is just 1 over l so that that loading has been equally distributed over all sides and um uh, so again going back to the hamiltonian uh the hamiltonian has three terms is that is is that term sx sx term and sy sy term now the sx sx and sy sy terms 
let us call that uh, the transverse terms. Um, the, the one along the Z is the longitudinal term. There's just a nomenclature. And it turns out that if you consider this, is per, so this perpendicular is basically Sx plus Sy. I mean, it consists of Sx and Sy operators. So uh, this at i dot s perpendicular at g, you take this operator as the transverse spin operator or the transverse part of the Hamiltonian and you evaluate expectation value of this operator. Uh, so basically, this will give you a correlation function uh, for different i and j. So this is what, you know, this is a transverse spin correlation function. And if, if you work this out, so this will work out to, again, this is a simple algebra. This will work out to t dot i minus. Uh, for any IJ actually. So, um, okay, so uh, on an average, the spins have a transverse component, which is this to the power of half. And, the, and this can be interpreted as the transverse components of the spin at the site i and g, making an angle k dot ri minus rg. So all these things taken together gives you sort of a uh, sort of a physical picture of what this is. So basically I am creating one unit, one unit of spin excitation, but instead of this being localized at a particular site, this is now equally distributed over all sites. And as a result, the spin at each site is no longer in the maximally polarized state with a Z equal to S, but uh, when I consider two spins at the sites R, 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 I and J, they, they, they are transverse components sort of make an angle, which is K dot Ri minus Rj. So I can have such excitations for different Ks. So these are like collective excitations of the, of the spins, of all the spins. And these excitations are what are called uh, spin waves. Now you see why they are called spin waves or equivalently these, these, as you obviously see, these are quantized excitations because I can change Z only by units of one, one, two, and so on. So therefore these excitations are quantized and these quantized excitations of the spins, these are called magnons. These are uh, exactly equivalent to phonons, which are excitations, quantized excitations of, of lattice vibrations, uh, la uh, lattice positions. Here, the spins are getting excited from the ground state, and these are called magnons. And they, they act as bosons. Um, there are more than one ways you can see it, but the simplest way to argue for that is that uh, you know, for a general spin S situation, there are two S plus one orientations of uh, values of SZ at each side. So when, I, when I'm talking of spin excitation at a particular site, I can lower SZ by one unit, two units, three units, and so on, all the way up to two S plus one units. Uh, or rather, the excitations would be uh, two S units maximum. Uh, SZ can take two S plus one values. So therefore, if I call each, uh, you know, changing of SZ by one as my one magnon, then obviously I can have more than one magnons at a particular site. And therefore uh, these are bosons. That's one way of saying it. 
So these are bosonic excitations, selective excitations about the ground state of the ferromagnetic uh, model. And when you have calculated this quantity, what you have, what you can also calculate is E epsilon k, let's call that epsilon k, which is E k minus E zero. And now this is the, So this is the energy of the magnon with, with wave number k and 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 um, so well that's the that epsilon k gives you the magnon dispersion relation and we'll we'll derive the magnon dispersion relation for the ferromagnetic model Any questions at this point? Uh, so what is the significance of this third matrix element? Third matrix element. I mean, the third point matrix element? The matrix element. Sorry, say that again. This three, uh, the matrix element that you have written, S1, I, S, uh, the S, I, S, J. Uh, uh, uh. Matrix element. I don't see. I mean, matrix. in the third point that you have written. Oh, here, here, here. Ah, okay. Yeah. So these, these are so. So I'm calculating matrix element of that. And if you had the spins in a maximally polarized uh, situation, then these matrix elements would be zero. But, uh, but because you have created those excitations, uh, these are not zero anymore. And for two different sides, the, the sort of correlations of the transverse spin operator is per is is like that. Okay. Uh, there is a let me see if I can easily find that out. Then I'll show you. or if it gets too complicated, then I'll leave it. Uh, I have, I have mentioned in my notes, uh, I'll, uh, I'll share the updated notes once more, um, that, yeah, here. Yeah. Where is it? Uh -huh. If you see this figure, 33.7, this is from Ashcroft's book. Um, so, the, so the panel A in that figure, that's the maximally polarized state. These are sort of, you know, schematic classical way of viewing things, but gives you a physical sort of idea what one is talking about. Uh, but you really should not think about quantum spins as the spin vector being rotated like, so these are just different is z states. But anyway, so that's the panel A is the maximally polarized state and panel B is the spin excited, I mean, this magnon state where um, as you go along the lattice, the transverse component of all the spins is lowered by the same amount, but as if the angle between these two, uh, when you calculate this transverse correlation function, it's a function of their distance. And so that gives you a sense of the wave number. Uh, 
So that gives you the wave number k. It's related to the wave number k. Okay. Anything else? Okay, so uh, once again, magnons are bosonic excitations above the ground state of the ferromagnet. So let us define this boson creation and annihilation operators, uh, call them as usual, the AIs and AI daggers, the annihilation and creation operators, which obey the usual commutation relation. Uh, sorry, so I'll write G here, delta IG. And if I have operators on two different sites, E is on two different sites, sorry, E daggers on two different sites, they will commute. So these are my bosonic operators. Now, the point, first point to notice or realize is that I cannot define AI to be simply, um, or AI dagger rather. So this dagger, is um, so A is let me see the creation operator. So creation operators, bosonic creation operator is what reduces the Z component from S to S minus one. So it has to be related to S minus, but it simply cannot be equal to S minus. There will be a problem. What will be the problem? Because at any site, I can have a maximum of 2S bosons. Because I can take the SZ value from S all the way to minus S. So there are 2S steps in that. But these are usual bosonic operators. So I, I, I should be able to use them as many times as, as I wish. Uh, but here what happens is if I apply uh, AI dagger on a state, maximally polarized state, state more than uh, 2s times, it takes me to an unphysical part of the Hilbert space where it tries to lower uh, the SZ value below minus it, which is of course not physical. So therefore, I have to take care of this problem. So I cannot directly put AI dagger equal to S minus. So that was the point. So this is avoided by what is called, and this whole scheme was, was sort of worked out by these two people. Um, These are what are called Holstein Primakov transformation. In this, um, so basically you need this because once again, AI, G, AI, dagger, AI, this cannot be greater than 2S. 
So in this transformation, you define things like this. There has to be an AI here. Now, this is good because if you, for example, try to use, let's see, uh, SI minus on the state minus. S at the site I. So if you try to do that, then uh, what will happen is, apart from these, you have this thing here. And in this part, so when some state is already in SZ equal to minus S state, the number of bosons at that site is already 2S. So this will give you one minus one, which is equal to zero. Okay. Uh, all right. One more thing you can check. I'll specify these things once again uh, in in your uh, exercise. If you if you uh, if you calculate this you should get twice SIZ and this is consistent. So if you write these now in terms of the A's and A daggers, you would get the same, uh, the same, same relation. So these definitions are consistent with this bosonic commutation relation. So, so that is something you can check. Okay. Step number three. Um, you want to evaluate this, which is again, I will not probably do the entire algebra. I mean, it's not difficult at all. It's just that you have to systematically do it. So S squared minus Now this value is of course S times S plus one. And again, these can be written in terms of S pluses and then S minus. So this is what you have to do, okay? Um, so you have to, for the S is a plus one fourth, for the X you get minus. And for the y, you will get minus. And then you can manipulate these things and write s plus and s minus in terms of a's and a daggers. So you can use these relations.
and then use bosonic commutation relations at appropriate places. So eventually, what we'll end up with is, uh, so this will give you S minus So then uh, SI Z is S minus, which is what you want because lowering when, I mean, you know, one boson means SZ is lowered by one unit. So when AI dagger AI is one, SZ is lowered by one unit on the site I and so on. So that is exactly how we define these quantities. And this is the relation that you get back. So then uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's consistent with our notion that creating one boson means reducing the XZ value by one. Okay, the algebra is something that I leave for you to fill out. Uh, the next thing that we want to do here is uh, to define, because we are interested in this superposition state with you know, some, some plane wave states. So uh, we want to define K space quantity. So we want to define sort of Fourier transforms of these A's and uh, A daggers. So the corresponding quantities in the K space would be called B's and B daggers. So this is how we define. And you can define the inverse transform as usual. So the BK dagger, uh, sorry, the BK would be. So then what, then again, you can evaluate these. And this is also a straightforward piece of algebra. You can, you can, you can write this commutation. I mean, in, in this commutation, you can write BKs in terms of the AK, uh, AI, and you know the commutation relation between AI. So using, you know, what you already know, uh, you can show this to be delta k k prime. Okay, now having written that, uh, I mean, what are we trying to do here? What, what we're trying to do here is to eventually write the Hamiltonian in terms of these bosonic operators. And then, uh, I mean, if, if we can sort of write this Hamiltonian in terms of a boson number uh, multiplying something, 
then we can we can define what the energies of these bosons are in a in a state with k wave number k so that's the target so the hamiltonian that we wrote in terms of sz and s pluses and s minuses we want to write those in terms of these operators uh, eventually the bk's and bk daggers and bk dagger bk will give me the number of bosons number of magnons with uh, wave number k so therefore what we try to do next is to write s plus and s minus in terms of this bk i mean we define those in terms of the a's and a daggers yeah ai's and ai daggers so now we'll write them in terms of the b so let us look at the expression for s plus s plus was so i'll work one out and the remaining you can fill in Now this is valid, of course, when this number a i dagger a i over two s is more than one. So the number of bosons is not too many. So that's how you interpret this, and we'll see that eventually we'll make approximations when we write the Hamiltonian in terms of the boson. number operators uh we'll see that we make approximation that is valid in the dilute boson limit that there aren't too many bosons so we'll look at only up to uh, bilinear in uh terms of to uh, that are bilinear in b and p tagger not not sort of magnon magnon interaction okay so next task is to uh, you know in this expression you replace the a's in terms of the b's so this is written as so there is a a here which is this then i'll have 1 over 4s so i have uh 2 1 over root l so that will give me a 1 over l and then i have three boson operators so i write them e dagger Uh, so this means and you will get a similar expression for is minus okay um so you can i'll just write the final 
expression for s minus So that is another piece and the last one is based on what we the expression we derived for SZ. So SZI is minus dagger AI. Now in this expression, in place of AI dagger and AI, you, you replace them by the Bs and so you'll get Okay, so these these are what we'll uh, require for uh, for you know uh, rewriting the Hamiltonian in terms of these operators. That is that is uh, something we'll come to. But before that, let us try to write the total is it? So is the total. is um, of course sum over i is z i now we have an expression for is z i so we we'll, we can just uh, put that there so the first term will just give me ls and then here i'll have a sum over ri And I pull the sum over Ri inside this. This factor. And then I have Bc. Now this sum over i over this term e to the i k1 minus k2 dot ri will just give me delta k1 k2. Okay, and that delta will take care of one of the k sums. So I'm left with uh, one k sum. And so this, this thing now becomes um, minus one over L. Let me write it here. So this Now this one over L, uh, this this whole thing, 
will uh, just leave me with one a sum and we get this. Is. So this thing is nothing but the number of the total number of magnons in the system. Okay. Magnon number at k summed over all k. So that will give you the total number of magnon numbers in the system. And the total z value is lowered from the maximal value ls by the number of magnons in your system. So, so far uh, things look consistent. This is what you would have expected uh, based on the sort of physical picture of a magnon that we gave earlier. So now the task is to rewrite the Hamiltonian, recast this Hamiltonian in terms of, uh, again, as I said, the B operators. So this involves, uh, quite a bit of algebra. So I don't think this is the right time to start it. So we'll do it next time. So I'll, I'll just uh, give you a hint of what we are, what we will eventually get when we follow through that exercise. So the Hamiltonian will turn out to be of this form. And these terms are so this is. This is bilinear in B operator. So basically this will involve magnon numbers, objects of this type. And coefficient of those, remember this is the Hamiltonian. So if I get something like BK dagger BK, this will be the energy of a magnon of wave number K. This term will not derive this explicitly. We'll leave out this term. These are um, quadrilinear in B. So these are these are magnon magnon interaction terms. But as I said, will not. Um, will not get into those terms. So we'll only work up to bilinear terms in these magnon numbers, which will give us magnon energies. So we'll learn what the magnon dispersion relation is that we talked about earlier. And again, to connect to what we have been discussing right from um, some of the earliest lectures, is that see what we have done is we have got a, we, we have got a ground state uh, by breaking a continuous symmetry. We had a, a continuous spin rotational symmetry in the system. But the ground state is a broken symmetry state. So that is obtained by breaking a continuous symmetry. So we should have gapless applications. We should have cold stone modes. That's a very general argument. So indeed, we'll find that uh, the magnons at small k's, as k goes to zero, magnons in the ferromagnet goes as k squared. So as k equal to zero, the energy is zero. So you do have gapless excitations in the system. So that we'll uh, discover next time. Okay, any question you have at this point?
Any question, Ayan?